from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. In the first couple years, the Attorney General's office uh, shut down about th over 30, and it put the fear of God in the rest of the breeders, and literally hundreds of breeders just surrendered their licenses. You know, when you see an animal that's suffering, it's hard to say, is that better or worse than the last time you saw an animal suffering? Are these typically licensed operations that just aren't following the rules, or are these underground, unlicensed operations um, just hiding? I'm Sarah Fenske. In 2011, a new law went into effect in Missouri. State voters had approved the Puppy Mill Cruelty Prevention Act the previous November at the urging of the Humane Society of the U.S. The law took on the dog breeding industry in Missouri, an industry that had earned the show me state infamy as the puppy mill capital of the U.S. Now, in classic Missouri fashion, the legislature then moved to gut what voters had approved. But then Governor Jay Nixon signed a compromise version into law in April of 2011. While it phased in some of the new requirements and watered down others, it still mandated big changes for dog breeders. That was 10 years ago. So what's changed in Missouri? Well, for one, approximately 50,000 fewer dogs are confined in commercial breeding operations in Missouri than was the case 10 years ago. That's according to the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. I have been investigating and trying to shut down cruel puppy mills since 1980. And I never thought in my lifetime I would see such a drastic uh, change in the environment of commercial dog breeding as, as it's happened in Missouri since the passage of the Canine Cruelty Prevention Act. And that is the executive director for the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation, Bob Baker. And joining us now with more on Missouri's dog breeding industry, an insight into what has changed in the past 10 years and what hasn't changed, is Debbie Hill. She's chief operating officer at the Humane Society of Missouri, and she also leads its Animal Cruelty Task Force. Debbie Hill, welcome to the show. Hi, Sarah. Great to be here. So, Debbie, take us back to 2010 and, and, frankly, the couple of years even before it. What was going on in Missouri with dog breeding that got the attention of your national organization? Well, you know, Missouri for a long time has had prolific dog breeding operations. And it really was statewide and almost state encouraged. And it was... It was a very profitable business, and that made it sometimes often a very cruel business. And we were doing, uh, we were seeing many, many animals suffering in these types of substandard facilities. In 2009, we had multiple high-profile uh, puppy mill rescue cases. Um, in fact, that year, 563 dogs were rescued from substandard puppy mill facilities. One of those took place in Greene County in Missouri that actually caught national attention and really beyond uh, national. And actually, we had animals that went traveled to the Oprah show, mm -hmm. if you can imagine. That's how... Uh, horrendous that particular case was, and it really captured the nation, and I think opened people's eyes to where that little puppy in the window comes from. So, Debbie, and, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the conditions at these operations. But but first, you mentioned that this was a really prolific industry here. What are the roots of this being such a popular occupation in those days in Missouri? You know, at the time, it was a it was a way to keep people on the farm. Um, there was a transition in the agricultural community. People were leaving farms, and this seemed to be a cheap and easy way. Hey, you know, convert some of your barns and whatnot into dog breeding facilities. It doesn't take a lot of space. Doesn't take a lot of time. You don't have to put much effort into it. You can cram a lot of animals in a very small space. 
Um, you, you know, it doesn't cost very much. And, you know, unfortunately, that's what people did. Hmm. And, you know, you would go through and, you know, when you raise animals like that, you know, the mothers and fathers of those puppies never get to leave that environment. You're going through and, and basically picking your crop of puppies, and those get pulled off and sent to market. And, you know, that's what the buying public would see. They wouldn't see the horrific suffering of the parents left behind and where that animal came from. People started hearing the horror stories about all the health problems sometimes these puppies would have, all the behavior problems that they would start seeing until people started putting sort of two and two together. And then, you know, as we were able to do rescues, because sometimes it's very hard to get on these substandard facilities like anything else. If you're doing something that's illegal and unethical, you probably take pains to hide that. Mm -hmm. But getting onto the facilities and bringing it to the light of day, I think, really started changing people's minds. And that's how you know, change started to happen. And so for these big operations and, you know, these kind of like substandard mills to the point that these dogs are, are going on Oprah because they've endured such terrible condition, was this a matter of Missouri not enforcing laws or was this a matter of there just not even being laws on the books? It, it was really a combination of both. I mean, Missouri had some laws on the books, we have the Animal Cares Facilities Act prior to the law that we're talking about today, but it really was just bare survival, it, and really sometimes not even that. So you mentioned the dog breeding um, industry in Missouri prior uh, to 2010 to 2011. This was almost state-sanctioned. Um, was this a good driver for the state economy? People were happy to look the other way in some quarters. Well, sure. I mean, you know, in, you're, you're certainly interested in revenue, but not revenue where the price is so high. I mean, look, it, you know, if, if I was to grow a crop of lettuce or something, I would be required to meet certain standards because of, you know, health and safety. And, you know, this impacts other people, too. Remember, these animals are going into someone's home. This becomes now a member of the family. And there is a cost to doing things badly, certainly for the animal's sake itself, but also you're, you're now transplanting some of that misery to a whole new family. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, states, other states don't look favorably on Missouri when they see that problem transplanted and they start getting calls from their residents going, wait a minute, I just got taken by this business in Missouri. How are you going to help me? So this was a big problem, um, and Missouri was developing this national reputation in precisely the way you wouldn't want to have that, that sort of Correct. reputation. The Humane Society of the U.S. announced it was going to do this ballot initiative. Um, what was the reaction uh, within the, the industry, people who are breeding dogs and people who are involved well, in this, when they made that right, announcement? And, and this was a huge partnership of animal welfare agencies all working together. And, of course, there was massive opposition from the other side, who, of course, you know, we're making money by being able to work in secret and not being regulated and, you know, not having to, you know, do the things that they were already supposed to be doing and certainly not having to do anything beyond, you know, even the bare minimum and to not have anyone looking over their shoulder and going, gosh, you didn't feed your animal for the last three days, you know, that, that should be corrected. So there was massive opposition to that. And, you know, there were ad campaigns taken out. There was all kinds of false information put out there. There were bad things happening and being said. You know, we had to watch security for some of our people. And, and sometimes that just goes with the, the territory, but you just have to stand fast and, and you know, persevere and know that this is the right thing to happen and understand it, it is absolutely about the animals, but for every animal, there will be a person attached to that animal as well. Mm -hmm. you, you can't overlook the fact that 
that there is the human and animal bond, and you cannot separate the two. So voters in Missouri ended up um, saying yes to this Puppy Mill uh, Cruelty Prevention Act. This was passed by voters. Were you surprised in light of that pushback? <laughs> well, it, it, and, it, and it's a convoluted story, but, but Prop B passed, and then the legislature overturned it, and then there was the compromise um, solution that, that ultimately was won. So it was a very hard-fought battle, and, and it truly was a battle in every sense of the word. And, and it was, you know, months in the process and lots of work and strategy and sweat and tears and compromise and, and all of those things that went into it. And, and it's all about making it better for the animals that may live their entire lives there, how can you make it more survivable for them, more tolerable for them, to not be a, a physical and mental torture every single day? That was the difference that we were trying to make. Well, Bob Baker, again, he's the executive director of the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. He believes that this law, the one that ultimately ended up going into effect here in Missouri, that this has had a tremendous success. And he described for us some of the specific changes that it mandates. Prior to this law passing, the cages only had to be six inches longer than the dog itself. So it'd be like housing a beagle in the size of a, of a dishwasher for its entire existence, never even seeing the light of day and just being bred over and over again. Now the, the amount of space for in cages has to be increased dramatically. And really important is they now have to have unfettered access to an outdoor run so they can get exercise, they can get access to sunlight and fresh air. They're no longer allowed to be housed on wire flooring, which was very typical prior to the new law passing. And probably the most significant thing is the animals have to have a vet exam at least once a year. And on top of that, if an inspector comes out and finds a dog suffering or, or sick or injured and it hasn't been treated by a veterinarian, they can be cited. Believe it or not, in the past, they could not be cited, even for not providing veterinary care to an injured or sick animal. And Bob Baker also mentioned that before this law went into place, only local prosecutors could bring cases against bad operations. They rarely did so. And now, he says, Missouri's attorney general can step in. In the first couple of years, the Attorney General's office uh, shut down about th over 30, and it put the fear of God in the rest of the breeders, and literally hundreds of breeders just surrendered their licenses because they knew there would now be consequences for not complying with the law. Right now, Eric Schmidt has been absolutely fantastic. He has been really going after these breeders aggressively that are not complying with the law. And on top of this, not only is he closing down facilities, which Attorney Generals in the past have done, but he's actually going after him for uh, civil and criminal contempt because not only are they being shut down, but he wants them punished for allowing the conditions to deteriorate to the point where they have to close them down. And I think this is sending a message to a lot of the breeders that you better start complying with the law because there are consequences. Not only will you lose your license, but you can go to jail. And that, again, is Bob Baker. He's the executive director of the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. So, Debbie, it sounds like after this law finally went into effect, there was a big and very swift uh, change that happened in Missouri. There was. I, I think it was the wake-up call maybe that a lot of sort of the old guard of breeders needed to have. So get on board or get off. <laughs> and some people chose to get off. And, you know, that was the right thing for, the, for them to do. And really from, you know, once Prop B passed from November 2010 to October 2012, uh, we worked with Missouri Department of Agriculture and over 1,300 dogs came to the Humane Society of Missouri as part of that process, uh, dogs that were voluntarily surrendered or as part of an agreement um, in, in that process that were, and these were breeding stock animals. There certainly probably were some puppies in those groups well, but these are breeding stock animals. And that was, that's a huge number. Hmm. And as, you know, Bob alluded to earlier, in the number of puppies that that impacts is just 
tremendous and ongoing, and it really has a cumulative effect on just the overpopulation of animals in the state. And so all of that, we think, has had a cumulative impact to the better as far as reducing numbers of animals that will end up in shelters really for years to come. So it truly was a tremendous impact that we could see very, very quickly, and then really over a period of years because, you know, the Canine Cruelty Prevention Act didn't all go into effect immediately. Parts of it were phased in to allow those breeders who wish to stay time to make the capital improvements to their facility, to make the enclosures larger, to get the unfettered access to the outdoors that was required. So all of that was built into the process. So really, you know, the final product has really been in force now for about, you know, five years. We're talking today to Debbie Hill. She's the Chief Operating Officer for the Humane Society of Missouri. She also leads its Animal Cruelty Task Force. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. Our guest today is Debbie Hill. She's the Chief Operating Officer for the Humane Society of Missouri. She also leads its Animal Cruelty Task Force. And we're talking about all the changes that have happened in Missouri since the state gained infamy as the puppy mill capital of the U.S. Um, A law went into effect that changed a whole bunch of things. Uh, That was about 10 years ago that that began. And as Debbie pointed out, it was a process of different things being phased in and different legislative battles to get to this point. But a lot of things have changed. Um, Debbie, we heard earlier from Bob Baker, the executive director of the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. And he mentioned that in the two years after this law finally went into effect, more than half of the commercial breeders in the state closed. So the state went from about 2,000 licensed dog breeders in 2009 to less than half that amount. Debbie, do we know, did they set up in other states or did they end up just closing down, going out of business? The majority of those really closed down completely and left the industry. Now, I think there were a handful that went to other states, um, but the majority of those completely left the industry. Hmm. So we're left with about 900 or so breeders operating in Missouri today. Those are the licensed ones. Overall, are they doing a good job? Uh, According to Missouri Department of Agriculture, they feel that they are. Um, Now, there's always, you know, the process of, you know, maintaining the regulations, going out and doing the inspections, and, you know, keeping up with the enforcement. Enforcement is such a huge part of, you know, this whole process. And we have seen periods in the past, as administration changes, as our state veterinarian appointments change, sometimes that, you know, doesn't necessarily maybe meet... um, meet the mark. But, you know, right now I think we're in a really good place with the current administration and Missouri Department of Agriculture. As Bob mentioned, you know, um, Attorney General uh, Eric Schmidt, you know, really putting his foot in the road right now and moving things uh, forward, you know, in the right direction and keeping the momentum going and that, you know, this is the direction we want to be. You know, there's, there's nothing against breeding per se, um, but you have to do it the right way. You have to take care of the complete animal, not just the one you're going to sell, but the one that you're going to keep and the one that you're using 
in your business. You know, there has to be con- some consideration for that animal as well. So, Demi, the, the sense of the state is that most are doing a good job, and yet there are still these problem operations. A 2021 report by the Humane Society of the United States found that Missouri has more problem puppy mills than any other state. That's 21. Is what you're seeing um, as you work on cases like this, are these as bad as the ones in Missouri prior to 2011? I think there are certainly less of them. And the ones that I have seen, certainly most recently, there are fewer animals within them. Um, You know, it's hard to say, you know, when you see an animal that's suffering, it's hard to say, is that better or worse than the last time you saw an animal suffering? It's never, it's never a good thing. And, And I can cite a a couple of recent cases that are pretty horrendous. You see a starving animal, you see an injured animal that has not been treated, and that's that's not to be tolerated ever. But it's certainly not as prolific as it was. So what you're seeing today when it comes to some of these problem operations, are these typically licensed operations that just aren't following the rules, or are these underground, unlicensed operations um, just hiding? You see both. Um, You still see both. Um, And you see, you know, some of the same issues that we saw before. Uh, Like you say, not quite as prolific um, you know, Bob had mentioned about, you know, the getting rid of the wire strand floors, and that was, that was you know, one of the most important things in the Canine Cruelty Prevention Act to me was getting rid of those wire strand floors, you know, seeing animals having to balance on those wires, you know, for years and seeing their mangled, torn feet and, you know, broken limbs and exposed bones and, you know, those... Those are very hard images to forget, and knowing that at least that has been alleviated, you know, is much better. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, people looking to make a quick buck are going to look for different variety of means to do so. This may still be one of those, but, you know, know that, you know, there are people out there that you know, are going to be looking and hopefully reporting, whether it's to Humane Society of Missouri or to the Missouri Department of Agriculture or to local law enforcement. Um, And, you know, you, you probably will be stopped. Is there anything right now that you'd say, you know what, these previous package of reforms we did, this is one thing we missed. Here's where this falls short, and here's the law I would like to see on the Missouri books today. I think, you know, you always could, you know, do just a little bit more. Gosh, you know, you'd love to see the size of the enclosures go a little more. If an animal has to live their entire life in some sort of an enclosure, you'd want it to be as big as as certainly as possible. Um, You know, as far as enforcement, you know, as as people are falling short of the mark, Um, It would be nice to shorten that administrative process time is just sometimes that takes, you know, months to kind of work through the process where someone finally reaches the point where they're, okay, maybe their license is going to be pulled now because they've, you know, failed so consistently. So you could shut down a a bad operation a little faster. Move that along a little faster and not have it drag on, you know, quite so long. I think it's important to maintain, you know, veterinarians as part of the inspection force. Um, I think when the law was passed, um, we had three uh, veterinarians as inspectors. I think we're down to two now. It would be nice to have that third a veterinarian in the field doing inspections. And, and, and Debbie, really is, need... is that something where um, the state no longer is funding that position, or there's just an opening right now? I think I think there's an opening that has not been filled. Mm. So um, you'd like to see important, a third yeah, person important in there. to have state veterinarians, and the veterinarians, you know, need are needed to testify as well. If you're if you're having to take, you know, the bad uh, breeders to court, you know, you need to have that 
professional staff, you know, who can testify and to counter, you know, the false statements that a bad breeder, you know, may try to make in court. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's very important to have. Well, it's interesting thinking about this problem as it still exists on some level, as you say, not nearly as bad as it was, but it is still an issue in Missouri today. Uh, Bob Baker, who's the executive director of the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation, he stressed something you've also spoken about today, that this is a nationwide problem. And he notes, again, like you, that puppies bred in Missouri end up being sold in pet stores across the U.S., this is what I tell uh, legislators in other states. This is not just a problem here in Missouri because these dogs are being sold in your state and these dogs are awfully, oftentimes sick or have genetic defects. And so states are listening. In fact, California has banned the sale of dogs in pet stores. So is Illinois, our neighboring state of Illinois, because so many of their consumers in their states had purchased dogs that originated in Missouri and they were sick or ill or had genetic problems. And so states, we now have the five states that have totally banned the sale of dogs in pet stores. And over 400 municipalities have taken uh, action in themselves and they have banned the sale of dogs in their municipalities. So it is sending a message that pet stores are not the best place to be buying a dog. And that, again, is Bob Baker of the Missouri Alliance for Animal Legislation. Debbie, do you think Missouri would ever join Illinois and get to the point where we would ban these kind of sales in pet stores when we've seen, um, you know, some of these bad operations here firsthand? Well, I, I tell you what, I you know, I get to the point where you, you never say never because, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't think we'd be here. So Missouri has come a long way, and I have faith that we can move uh, further. We might move a little slower sometimes than, than we would like, but I think anything is possible, and I think that's probably the direction things will be going, because I think most people demand that. You know, most people, when they see the facts and they see the conditions, and and they see, you know, go to our website and, and look at the photos of animals coming out of these types of facilities. You know, it 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 takes money to raise quality puppies. I mean, it just does. It's it's hard to do on a very short budget. And so if you're making those kinds of cuts then, you know, you're probably not coming out with a very good quality product. And so when you try to, you know, ramp up and just do it with so many, many, many animals, and that's what people had tried to do in the past, it just fails. It fails miserably. And we're just not going to put up with that anymore. And I think people, you know, are, you know, getting the calls and they're, they're calling and reporting, and they're calling and reporting. You know, I hear lots of dogs barking, and, you know, something's going on over there. And, you know, they're calling and saying, you know, there, there's something not right, and those animals are starving. And I see that, you know, those animals are so matted they can't walk anymore. And, you know, the animal is injured, and he's not being treated. And we cannot allow that. You know, there there is a way to do things correctly and to make sure you're providing for all the needs of the animals. And that's the only way to make them safe and happy and healthy pets, which is what we should all want. And it, it feels like you feel like there has been a sea change in how we think about this, that overall people are not willing to tolerate this kind of thing in their midst, um, and, and that these there has been some big changes in Missouri in the last 10 years when it comes to dog breeding operations. I think, yes, in Missouri, and I think just in in sort of the the pet acquiring public they're they're not necessarily looking to the pet stores anymore they are looking to shelters and rescues and their neighbors and they're very they're much more socially conscious now about where that animal comes from and their impact on sort of the overall picture and their responsibility and part in that, which is, you know, a very good thing um, to see that, that people are really thinking that through. 
and making that choice, which is, you know, really helpful to all of us. There, there are always um, more good people out there than there are bad. You know, sometimes we see, we see a lot of the bad actors, but, you know, you always have to remind yourself, you know, there are the people who are picking up the phone and making that phone call that saves an animal. There are the people who may call and and donate their time to come and volunteer at a shelter or donate their money to help, you know, pay for a medical procedure for a rescued animal. You know, the good people do outweigh the bad, and, and that's, what's, that's what's really going to turn the tide. Well, Debbie Hill, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. We, we, uh, we love to talk about this kind of progress. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering by Aaron Dorr and production assistance from Jane Mather Glass. It was mixed and edited by Aaron. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.